Welcome to episode 26 of Military Veterans Podcast, where we talk to veterans to learn about their stories and experiences. And today we're joined by Sue Warner. Hello, Sue. Hello, Gavin. How are you? I'm very well indeed, and it's a real honour and privilege to be with you and to have this time together. No problem. Well, it's actually an honour for me to have you on as a guest. So thank you for inviting me to your lovely home um, and, uh, yeah, inviting me in to get all this equipment set up. It took me a while, so thanks for the patience. Well, it's <laughs> been uh, quite an honour for me um, to see all this wonderful technical equipment being set up. I think it's wonderful what you do and uh, thank you from my heart. It's brilliant. That's no problem at all. Well, I'm excited to connect with you again. Uh, we might touch on how we cross paths oh, yes. um, later on in the episode, but uh, we're going to start off with the four questions, just as a summary uh, of what we're going to go into for your episode. Um, and again, just as a bullet point answer, and, and then we'll, we'll hear the main part of it later. Does that sound all right? Yep, sounds brilliant. Good stuff. So the first question is, when did you join the military? Gosh, I joined the military in October 1977. Okay. I was 18 years old. 18 years old, mm. teenager. Yeah. Um, the next question is, what service and branch did you join? Well, I joined the Queen Alexander's Royal Naval Nursing Service. So I was part of the Royal Navy. Okay, yeah. that's quite a mouthful. Is, is that shortened to anything these days? Quans. Quans. Known as a quan. Not to be confused, um, the army are QAs um, okay. and uh, we are quans. Okay, uh, I, I'll probably ask some silly questions as we get going, <laughs> so uh, apologies if I ask again. <laughs> uh, the third question is, how long did you serve for? I served for a total of 25 years. Yeah, 25, I can't believe it. 25 it's, yeah. years? good and then what rank did you get to i got to a senior nursing officer's post okay and again i may ask some silly questions regarding the different ranks uh as this is navy kind of yeah naval ranks i guess yeah um but uh that's all good that's all good i'm really excited to hear what you've got to share so let's rewind let's go back to the beginning uh where was you born and where did you grow up well i was born in london uh, and London's where I grew up. And yet, um, I've lived in Belfast quite some time now. And I'd say Belfast is certainly my home. Um, but as you can tell, I do not have an Irish accent. I've still kept my London accent. Uh, so growing up in London um, was quite an amazing time. Um, it was uh, in our time, of course, we had uh, lots of you know, going, you know, going off to schools and uh, various clubs and things. But yeah, London was the place. Yeah. And how did you find school as, as for you? How was yeah. school? School was, uh, um, again, it was uh, something I was uh, moved to a, an all girls school. And that was quite uh, that was quite hard actually, um, because the girls were all from different backgrounds, and settling into the school was quite uh, it took quite some time. Uh, but I found school quite interesting because my grandmother, who was quite influential to me, um, was a nurse, and uh, I think I at the age of five I can remember feeling, yeah, this is something I want to do. I want to be a nurse. Well, of course, when I was growing up through the 60s and at school, it was sort of seeing, well, yes, nursing is a, it, it is a lady's profession. So it was all sort of, oh, yes, this is, this is, this is very good. Um, so, yes, it was kind of uh, um, a time where I really got focused that, yes, I was going to go and train and be a nurse. Okay. So the main ambition as a youngster was nursing. It wasn't so much the military at all? The military sort of came in a little later. As okay. I got to uh, my grandmother sharing more and more about her life, um, you know, she told me that she had actually served in World War One. Really? And she was on the front line um, serving as a nurse with the army. 
Now, this started to fascinate me because uh, she then, of course, you know, met my grandfather. So she left nursing and uh, it was only during World War Two that she had the opportunity to go and serve uh, at a local hospital. And this really interested me. I thought this lady has gone back to nursing um, and even up to the time she died, um, she was actually nursing. So I was so touched by this because nursing at that time was, if you were a married lady, it wasn't very desirable. Okay. But uh, she managed to show that actually you can be a married lady and you can also nurse. So she was your maybe biggest influence in, within your life? Absolutely. I think my grandmother was the lady that uh, really sort of got me focused, that this was something I was interested in, the caring profession. She was a very kind uh, lady, very intelligent um, and very, very wise too. And that really influenced me how she would give of her time there was a little saying that there's no time to rush in life. And I, I used to find that quite poignant, that no matter what's going on, there's time. There's time to listen um, and time just to be. Yeah, I was quite impressed by that. That's quite a good um, sentence for sure. And maybe I should start <laughs> replaying that, what we just recorded. So. <laughs> and so uh, you, you said that you went through childhood, you enjoyed childhood. Um, and so when you were at school, uh, with the focus potentially of, mm. of being a nurse when you were older, um, did that kind of determine where you uh, studied and, and what you learnt? Or was it because of being a girls' school, uh, everybody got the same kind of options? I think because it was a girls' school, we did have the same options. And I think it was very much seen that girls didn't really going to have much of a career um, okay. and yet um, saying that the 60s was the beginning of ladies and women being encouraged to become doctors and I think a lot of women were being encouraged to actually uh, go to university more um, so yeah the school was a little bit old-fashioned in kind of values for ladies and um, but I found myself sort of, well, actually, ladies also can have careers, can have, well, determinations and ambitions. And uh, it's important um, not to just sort of think a lady is just going to marry and have children. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that was uh, that sort of kept me kind of, oh, hold on here. There is more to life than just um, being a lady. Yeah. And then at what point did you actually decide to make that transition, let's say, into the military? Uh, you mentioned you were you were fascinated by grandmother. Um, yeah. But what, what was the pinnacle moment, I suppose, for you actually joining up? I think it was when we had a careers session at school. And I can remember this lady came along who had actually served in the Queen Alexander's Royal Naval Nursing Service. And uh, she kind of shared that she found it a, a very moving time in her life. And I think it started to hit me, actually, this is uh, a different way to train, that you join and you could be travelling because I think in that time there were still travels to Hong Kong, to Malta, Gibraltar. Um, and I was going, oh, that would be interesting to, to have that opportunity, not only to train, but to actually travel abroad. Okay. But did I realise when I went along for my interview with Matron that she actually said to me, I don't think you will travel very far, not further than the Gosport Ferry. Um, well, how many thousands of miles later? <laughs> so how was it back then? How did you join up? Was it like we got today, we've got careers offices? You said you had people come and have a chat, but how was it done back then? Well, back then, you then, we didn't have, uh, I don't remember going to a careers office, but what I do remember is um, having to write to the Quan's head office, uh, which was in those days, it was in, I think it was somewhere not far from Wimbledon. Okay. Um, 
and asking for the forms to join up. And I remember filling in these forms that were quite detailed. Um, and then when you submitted them, you had to wait quite a while, actually, before you were told whether you had got through to an interview. Now, in those days, that your interview took place at Ron Ava, well, mine did, at Ron Ava Hospital Hasler, and they would run these interviews about once a month. Um, and you would join um, about five other ladies um, at the interview, and you spent two days there. Now, that was quite nerve-wracking for a young... I mean, I was only now about 17 years old mm. um, to be away from home. Uh, it's not like nowadays there's lots of people having sleepovers, and um, but uh, certainly there hadn't been so many sleepovers when I was growing up. So it was kind of a bit novel, this, oh, we're going to have to go and uh, spend a night at this hospital in a dormitory with four other ladies who I didn't know. Um, and it seemed quite testing. And then the next day you had your medical examination followed by your interview. And on my interview panel was Matron and two of her superintendent nursing sisters and that was quite daunting to go into this room and sit there and to discuss that uh, yes I wanted to be a nurse and to have the opportunity to train in the Royal Navy mm. so yeah that was a little bit of a brave thing to do um, and I can always remember going along there with my little case <laughs> and thinking oh yeah it was it was quite a big thing. So the Quans. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, oh, yeah, well done. Good. Um, just remind me and probably others listening what that stands for, the full name. Yeah, it's the Queen Alexander's Royal Naval Nursing Service. Okay. And back then, was that that's actually part of the, the, the Navy there and then? No, what, what had happened was the Queen Alexander's is quite an interesting history. Um, Mrs. Eliza McKenzie was the founder of the Naval Nursing Service. Now, she noted way, way back that uh, sailors were coming off ships very injured or wounded and there was no one to look after them. So her and a team of ladies from Florence Nightingale's uh, team actually started to look after the sailors and provide care. And then it soon became very popular. The Admiralty weren't so keen on it at first that ladies were looking after these people, the sailors, the sea persons, but um, they soon realised actually it was needed and necessary. And then in 1902, what's really interesting is Queen Alexandra actually became interested in wanting to be a patron to the service. So she gave permission for her cross days, her monogram, to be used. And so now the service became the Queen Alexander's Royal Naval Nursing Service. And then later on, the service became under the Naval Discipline Act, which now meant you were now part of the Royal Navy. Okay. So when you when you joined up or when you sat in front of those people and had your interview, at that point, was you joining the Navy or was you joining the, the Quans. Yeah. At that, <laughs> at that point, you were joining the Quans. Um, but it was very soon short lived that, yes, the Naval Discipline Act was to come in and you were part of the Royal Navy. Okay. And that's how all the ranking system changed. Right. Um, right. That you would then either be uh, a non commissioned rating or you would be a officer, okay. a nursing officer. Etc. Well, we'll hopefully cover that <laughs> shortly. But before you do, um, before you share any more about that, uh, you spoke about uh, the panel and you mentioned matron. I I'm guessing that's a position within within the Quans. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Matrons still existed, mm. um, whereas I know in the National Health Service for a little while they aborted matrons, um, but now we do have them back in okay. our. National Health Service. But yes, Matron was head of 
Royal Naval Hospital Hasler, but there was also a matron in chief who was head of the Quans. Okay, yeah. okay. And so when you joined that part uh, and clearly you were successful through the interview process, um, but when you joined, was it was it a case of basic training like we have these days? Uh, not so much, actually. Um, certainly when you joined, what would happen was we would have um, instruction on marching. Um, oh, really? okay. But we didn't actually, in, in my time, do marching. That sort of came along later. Um, I understand now that the nurses um, go to HMS Raleigh and yes, go through a basic training process. But in our day, we went to Royal Naval Hospital Hasler and we joined the School of Nursing at Hasler. And then you had instruction on marching or you had instruction on what the rating system was in the Royal Navy. But as such, um, we weren't sort of doing basic training. So was it, is it nurse training, nursing yeah, training, that's nursing, what you got? Certainly nurse training, yeah. definitely. You join up um, and you wear a uniform called a J-cloth. Okay. It's just a, a blue check dress. Now that signifies you that you really are a probationary nurse and that lasts for about... Uh, I think it was about three months, if I remember rightly. I might be a bit off my dates there, Gavin, but That's good. something like that. <laughs> um, but yes, and you um, pass some examinations to uh, go on to the next part. And that means that you then wear the full naval uniform, which is like a jeans, a jeans coloured um, dress okay. with the um, apron, the cuffs um, and the butterfly hat with the crossed A's monogram on the front. Um, and again, you pass yet another examination at six months where you received your naval nurse's buckle, okay. uh, which was, uh, that was, uh, that was something everyone looked forward to, oh, get the buckle. And now you are a proper naval nurse. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, certainly the probationary time. Um, I think it could have even been six weeks or three. I, do you know, I'm sorry about this. I'm having That's a fine. senior moment. But it's a while yeah. ago. <laughs> uh, but you certainly um, had that time of just being a probationer, uh, which was quite daunting because I remember going on to the children's ward. That was my very first ward. Um, and I was given the duty to um, help a little boy to to have a bed bath and, and he wasn't really being cooperative. And I remember sort of playing aeroplanes with him, you know, oh, here comes the sponge now, that sort of thing. Um, and he really lapped this up and, uh, you know, and we were really doing very, very well. But unbeknown to me, behind the curtains, um, there was my nurse tutor <laughs> um, there um watching what i was doing but that really touched me because it made me realize that this little boy i mean he was scared he was frightened and it was trying to find another way to to work with him and uh you know we were successful together in getting this bed bath done and getting his bed changed and uh yeah it was quite an interesting time mm. So did you, uh, I guess, find your feet pretty quickly when you when you joined up and completed those tests and those, uh, I guess, change in uniform? Yes, I, I think you do, actually. Um, I think one thing working in the Quans teaches you is to think on your feet pretty quick. And I think you do find your feet pretty quick, too even though Matron was sort of saying, well, you're not going to find your sea legs, you're only going to go across the Gosport Ferry. Well, yes, yeah. we were fine later and it wasn't <laughs> quite the case. But, uh, yeah, I think you do actually. And, you, again, you're studying as well and working on the wards. So that's quite, uh, quite tough mm. actually. And so in that Quans area, does, does that have uh, a rank structure like the military Yes, um, yes, it did. Yeah. Um, you would have like, we were known as naval nurses. Um, and then you would uh, have something called a senior naval nurse. 
to a, a an assistant head naval nurse to a head naval nurse. Now those were the like the non commissioned ranks, um, and then you had the nursing sisters, the nursing officers. Um, and they would be a, a, a junior nursing officer, senior nursing officer, superintendent nursing sister to matron to then um, matron in chief. So okay. it's quite, it sounds quite a mouthful, that, doesn't it? <laughs> it Quot. Does. Yes. <laughs> but even though uh, I guess later on it became under the wing yeah. of, of the Royal Navy, it was still pretty much... A, a military entity in itself, right? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, because that would seem the funny part that overnight it changed, that you sort of woke up and the next day now you were a lieutenant. Um, right. Uh, so, yeah, there was a big change there. So, uh, you, what, sorry, you joined in 77. Yeah. Uh, what year did it become part or, or completely underneath the Royal Navy? Do you know something there, Gavin? You've actually asked me. Do you know, I think it's a approximately i think something around the 90s seems okay. to ring bells so quite a uh, way in it was quite a way in that uh, even the uniform changed right, right, right. um that uh, where before you wouldn't you found you would have found it quite hard to have identified who was um a senior nurse to a uh, an assistant head or head naval nurse um yeah and then overnight suddenly if you know a lieutenant um that yeah it mm. was quite a big change okay. yeah well, we, we have a bit to cover yeah. before we get there so <laughs> what, what what's the kind of next few kind of steps for you in regards to uh i guess your first yeah first few years yeah it was interesting i remember my first few years kind of having to because the because when you're nursing you also come under the rules of the Nursing Midwifery Council. Well, when I started, it was the General Nursing Council, but it changed, which means you have to achieve certain assessments like medical nursing, surgical nursing, to be able to carry out a, a medication round, to be able to manage a ward and to be able to give total patient care. So there was lots of different segments to achieve and also pass your examinations in nursing and then, of course, your final examinations as well. And then you become registered. Well, it was then the General Nursing Council, but now, of course, it's known as the Nursing Midwifery Council. So, yeah, those were quite uh, quite hard at times because studying and working, it, it, it's quite a big balancing act you know, to get that equanimity. It doesn't always come together and not to burn the candle at both ends. Yeah, absolutely. If I'm getting the kind of dates in my head, correct. This is taking us into the early 80s. Yeah, is, is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so the 80s, it's a big time for the UK because something happens, doesn't it? That's right. That's right. It seemed no sooner had I qualified um, and I'd started now some night duties. Um, and then we had the Falklands conflict of 1982 and the hospital ship Uganda was requisitioned. Well, the it was, um, first of all, the Uganda was a ship that was an educational ship that was taking children around the Mediterranean and on this particular occasion into Italy. Um, what is, was that a British ship? It was a British ship, okay. that's right. And it was requisitioned um, to become a hospital ship. Okay. Uh, and the ship then um, went into Gibraltar, where the ship over a weekend, which is quite amazing, was absolutely um, converted into a hospital ship by um, having a hospital, uh, sorry, a helicopter platform built on. And the wards and the dormitories were all converted as well. Um, so it seemed that uh, there was just so much going on. And with the task force leaving Portsmouth on the 5th of April 1982 uh, was quite a, a big occasion. And to think this year, it is 40 years mm. Um, from that conflict, it, it's quite incredible. And the hospital ship now was being um, uh, refurbished 
and a group of uh, nurses from the Quans were going to be joining the ship. Now, at first, I was not on that first shipment at okay. all. Um, now, I was on night duty, and this was now a few weeks later. Now, remember, it takes three weeks to sail to the Falkland Islands. They're over 8,000 miles away. From the UK? From the UK. Um, So during that time, there was a further need arose and it was a call for more nurses and medical technicians to be um, sent out to the Uganda. Now, Matron, which I thought was very strange, was on the ward. And I thought to myself, now, this is not usual. On a Friday evening, that Matron would be on the ward. Um, But she came up to me and said, "Uh, well, you are going to join the hospital ship Uganda. Um, And literally, I only had 72 hours to prepare Now, bearing in mind in those days, the shops were not open on a Sunday. I really had to run around getting together some clothes, um, toiletries, and then also go and have vaccinations for typhoid and yellow fever and to be ready to leave on that Monday. So that seemed um, just, uh, just so much to do in such a short space of time and readjust myself back from night duty to day duty. Wow. Quite a big ask. Yeah. Um, and then we left. Wow. Uh, and went to Bryce Norton to fly on a VC-10 out to, it was to Dhaka, first of all, where we had to refuel, then down to Ascension, which in those days was just a hut, when okay. you arrived, okay. um, down to Montevideo, where I joined HMS Hecla and then sailed for five days down south um, and then was taken on the helicopter across to the Uganda. And no sooner had um, the little team I was with, we arrived, uh, we were put to work straight away. Wow. Uh, it was just, what? <laughs> so... Before that happened, you'd, you'd, you'd uh, only been in hospitals. Is yep, that correct? That's absolutely. So this is right. the first time you've been on a on a naval ship uh, since you would signed up. Is that absolutely, right? Absolutely, because at that time women were not permitted to go to sea. So for the first time on one of Her Majesty's ships, HMS Hecla, a woman had been allowed to to go on their ship. So that was quite, uh, um, again, just quite wow. And then, of course, for 40 women to be at sea as well on a hospital ship, I think the last time that had happened would have been Korea. So, yeah, it was uh, quite uh, making history, but also paving the way for how the Royal Navy was going to go in opening up opportunities for women to go to see um and that's quite incredible yeah and i can i can only imagine how maybe even more surprised you were with one having such a short notice of 72 hours to get ready to go um but was there any inc- inkling of uh of of females being able to go and be on ships before the falklands even happened it's funny actually at that time women just were not permitted. Yeah. So it was kind of, well, the conflict changed everything. And perhaps it's changed everything for the future too okay. in, in the fact yeah. that it's opened far more opportunities uh, for women, which is fantastic. But yes, in 1982, it wouldn't have been the done thing for uh, no. women women. To, to be at sea. Um, so, yes, this was kind of uh, pioneering again. Yeah, big shock as well, I, yeah. I, I'd say. Um, so you, you get to, um, is it called HMS Uganda it's, at that point? Um, it, I think that sort of was later on, but then it right. was known as S, or the hospital ship Uganda. Oh, hospital ship Uganda. Uganda. Okay, yeah. so, so, so you, you, you get there. Yeah. Um, what's your initial thought process once you get to that ship yeah I remember feeling just a bit overwhelmed uh, because I can remember it was quite 
it almost felt quite warm and yet it was in the middle of winter in the Falklands and thinking to myself, gosh, this is warm. But I, I think that was because really there was just so much going on. Um, the ship was receiving casualties now and each one of us in the, in the team I was with, we were all designated to our duties uh, and I found that my shift... Uh, was actually already on duty. So it was kind of literally drop your bags and just go. Um, and again, I had to um, get used to being in something called number eights, which were a pair of um, trousers and a top, because uh, obviously the nurse's dress was not going to be practical in such a situation. And because we were on the hospital ship Uganda, we wore plimsolls. Um, to try and protect their floor flooring, uh-huh. and and sort of going on to duty seemed um, it, it it was quite baffling mm. um, because I remember going because I was put down into the hull of the ship um, and that's where the dormitories were and when the ship was obviously the educational ship they found that this could be very useful, these dormitories, with their beds and um, with casualties um, coming to them. It was a a sort of um, best place, really, to be uh, in the hull, Uh, even though we also had an intensive care unit near the operating theatre. We had a sea view ward, which was like a reception, triaging people. Um, We later on had to have a burns unit and then we had to have an overspill from that unit as well. Um, So yes, it was just amazing to be in the hull of this ship and um, and we had all these dormitories. Um, But yeah, quite a a time. Mm. And so what what position or rank are you uh, yeah. at this point? At this point, I'm still a very junior nurse, just newly qualified. So okay. very junior in those days, naval and nurse. Naval <laughs> nurse, right. And, you you know, again, doing my maths properly, your early 20s. Yeah, so this now is in quite, my early 20s. Quite a shock. Yeah. yeah, it was actually to see people injured and hurt so much Um it, it, it really does touch your heart greatly and to see people in so much pain and discomfort and really you you just want to do the best that you can mm. to be of service, to be of a duty to people. So, yes, it, it is. And is this ship uh, actually docked in in uh, the Falklands or is it, is it no, slightly off, offshore? No, we're actually offshore. Okay. We were in something called the Red Cross Zone box because we were um, under the due restrictions of the International Red Cross, which is very much that we receive casualties. Right. And also I understand, if I've got this right, that um, the enemy have to know where we are, what we're doing. And uh, we are also lit up like a Christmas tree um, so as we're not attacked. Um, But uh, it it is, uh, yes, to be at sea in the full sense of the word. And the Falklands can be very choppy. And the winds that can go across the Falklands, and bearing in mind this is now the winter months, it could be very choppy at times, which was challenging if there was a a sensitive operation taking place, that the whole ship would be involved, the bridge in trying to keep a steady course, keep the ship steady, to the actual surgeons working, the nurses working. Uh, I mean, it was quite a, quite a, a new way of working. Mm. And you have to think about if you're carrying out a dressing, if the ship's going to roll, um, how is this you know, how are you going to carry out this duty? Yeah, yeah. So, and even um, with intravenous infusions, if, if if the ship's rolling around, how stable is that infusion? Uh, so there was a lot to think about, uh, mm. something very new uh, from being on a hospital ward. Yeah, massively. A silly question now, but was it anchored or was it actually in motion? Uh, sometimes the ship was anchored, yeah. but another time we were in motion. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so what? Um, who was you receiving on board? Was it was it uh, our, our British uh, soldiers and, and Marines or, yes. or, or was it Argentines as well? Yeah, 
We were receiving all. So, yes, we received British casualties as well as Argentine casualties. I think that's one thing I love about nursing is that we care for all. And we, um, it's really the priority is the wound, the injury, the sickness that really takes the priority and the need. Um, and that always feels a great privilege to be able to serve and do what you can for all humanity. Uh, so, yeah, very kind of taking everybody in. Yeah. And, and how long was you down there on that ship for? Yeah, we were there till, I remember we docked back at uh, Southampton on the 9th of August, 1982. Wow, okay. So it's a little so while. about four months. Yes, it was yeah. about that because the day that the surrender happened, which was the 14th of June, um, we still had work to do. We were still uh, receiving casualties and we were still looking after... Um, quite a few people at that time so yes we did stay on until uh, I think it was about sometime in July we sailed the three weeks back and arrived back on yeah. the 9th of August okay now this is a question and don't want to put you on the spot too much but that is obviously your first time mm. on, a, on a ship it's your first time being so far away from from home you can't really get much further from the UK and Obviously, you're you're fairly new, but still uh, got some experience. Was there anything on that ship, uh, a moment, a, a, an experience, a story that you can share that really stands out for you um, from your time on that ship? I think the one story that stands out to me is when the ceasefire happened, we actually had an opportunity to go on to Port Stanley itself and I found this particularly moving. I remember my first sighting of um, Port Stanley was sort of looking down at this long street and the, the, the houses and the tin roofs particularly struck me. And then way in the distance were the mountains, but they were covered in snow as it was now sort of end of June becoming into July. And... It really moved me emotionally that this was such a beautiful place and we soon became aware of the penguins <laughs> and, of course, nature, the wildlife on the Falklands. Um, it was very, very touching, actually, and that was a, a very emotional moment, uh, just that going on to the land at Port Stanley. Yeah. Yeah, very emotional. And there may be some people listening that, that aren't aware... Uh, that's the capital. Yes, right, of, that's of, of right. The that's Falkland the Islands. capital of the Falkland yeah, Islands. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, I, I was there in 2005, so oh. quite some years later. Yeah. Um, and, and, and as engineers, we were just helping out infrastructure and rebuilding roads and other things. But yeah. yes, the, the wildlife, the nature, and the wind. Oh, the <laughs> wind, yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely. But it's amazing um, that in that spate of time how the Falklands has grown mm, absolutely yeah, yeah. incredible um in fact I was only reading an article from the Falklands the other day and they were saying that uh, they've had a lot of tourism to the Falkland Islands and uh, and the nature reserves have grown and uh, and it seems they've been doing a lot of work on looking how of climate change environmental care it, it's quite impressive yeah yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot happens in 40 years, right? Yeah, since, I would have said so. I would have said so, <laughs> definitely, definitely. And so so you come back from the Falklands, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you've probably learned so much more uh, yeah. about nursing and about yourself mm -hmm. during that time. And what happens after that? What happens? How do you reconnect yourself with, with, with mainland? Yeah, it's interesting, actually. When I came back, you're right, when you come off of a ship, it's quite funny. It still feels like it's rolling around <laughs> on you. It takes a little while to get your feet balanced again. Um, and I really found myself opening to discovery, inquiry, okay. exploring. I wanted to know more about sickness, wounds, injuries, and specialisms in nursing. And I really developed this kind of discovery. I wanted to discover more, wanted to learn. So I 
I remember going to Matron and saying, Matron, I really want to take an opportunity to go and train more. And uh, she said, well, yeah, that seems like a good idea to me. But at the same time, nursing was going through a transformation. There was a change in the goalposts that now nurses were getting degrees. Um, in our day, you, you got a diploma in nursing. So it became that, yes, I was going to have to go and study for a degree in nursing. And then I found myself wanting to know more. So I took it up to a master's level okay. and ended up specialising more in adult care, children's care and mental health. Um, and then spent some time uh, working with the NHS um, and then also um, being on the volunteer reserves. So, yeah, it, it kind of, um, it was a big transformation, a big change in my life that uh, I really just wanted to learn more, to know more. Okay. So, yes. Okay. And so what what is the next, uh, I mean, this is now, you know, 80s. Mm. Um, what What's the big impact you've learned a lot in the in the 80s yeah uh, just just before it changes into you know being under the royal navy yeah aspect um but what what can you share from from that chunk of time there uh do you get promoted do, do you go to different locations within the uk yes i found that yes i was going to different locations and one of them was surrey okay now, Surrey was interesting. Um, I had the opportunity to work alongside both um, the military nurses and also the NHS nurses. So that was quite interesting, actually, because now the Navy was going through a big change too. We became part of something called a tri-service. So you had the Air Force, the Army and the Navy all joining together um, so that was a big sort of step forwards. Um, and again, a lot of nurses were now um, going on deployments to various civilian hospitals. And uh, if I remember rightly, Royal Naval Hospital Hasler had now closed as well. So the military training establishment all had deferred now to Birmingham. Okay. So this was a uh, uh, lots of change going on. Is it uh, still the eighties? Uh, no, we sort of uh, we're sort of coming up nineties to two thousand. We're sort okay. of going right the way through, sort of studying at university to then um, going on various secondments um, with uh, well both the NHS and the military. So it's a bit of both right, going right. on here. Um, but, yeah, we're sort of getting into the 2000s okay. time now. But it, it was such a – in a way, it was an exciting time. There was just so much change happening. Um, even within the Nursing Midwifery Council had certainly uh, – it, it just kind of expanded a lot. Mm. Um, and so, yes, it was a time of great change, great transformation and an opportunity to meet uh, very new lots of people. So, mm. yeah, quite a, quite a time. OK, so um, I do want you to touch yeah. on uh, the transition uh, to be part of mm. the Royal Navy. And you mentioned about, you know, waking up as an officer. Yeah. Um, but in, in the rest of the 80s, uh, before we touch mm. on that, uh, is there any other things that happen in regards to like deployments? Uh, because obviously the Falklands happened and that was essentially a mm. deployment. Um, or are you just on the mainland for, for, the, for the remainder of the, the 80s? Yeah, I was on the mainland mainly. Uh -huh. And uh, yes, I just went back to work at Royal Naval Hospital Hasler. Okay. And that was quite daunting, actually, because I can remember we sort of came off the Uganda, we were given two weeks leave, and then it was sort of, well, back to work. And that seemed quite difficult because all of a sudden it was just dealing with, it seemed, very basic things. Right. Whereas we were used to this kind of um, situations at the extreme. Yeah. So yeah, that was uh, that took time to to readjust to. Because um, ba battlefield injury, surely. yeah, it's just so different. So different, yeah. So different, yeah. Um, and the skills that are required, you're you're um, always having to hold hope 
keeping calm, always believing this time will pass and mm -hmm. you will get through this. And now, and now it seemed here we are on the ward, you know, bed number one, Mrs. So-and-so, da di da di da bed number two. Da, da. It, it just seemed very different. Yeah, but quite a quite a sort of oh right right and it also seemed that uh, where we were having to think much more on your feet now it was kind of oh yes you know dressings this this and routines I mean there was routines on the hospital ship but it now seemed the routine seemed just different yeah, yeah. Uh, and it did take time Okay. To to readjust and to get used to now being back on a hospital ward. And, of course, the ship was not rolling. Uh, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, had you been promoted, essentially, no. during that time? At that time, so still not... I was still a very junior naval nurse. And this is where I'd gone to Matron and asked and said, look, I'd really like this opportunity to go and train yeah. and to further my qualifications um and of course this is when i realized that yes nursing's going through a, a big transformation it was project 2000 for example which meant that uh, nursing was going to be a one level that they would have adult nurses mental health nurses learning disability nurses and nurses working with children and midwifery so there was this um yeah, big change happening. Mm -hmm. And whereas before nursing had been, you would study for your diploma at a school of nursing. Now the schools were closing and amalgamating with universities. So this was like uh, something very different that now I was having to apply to a university. Uh, so that was a big step too. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I didn't think that was going to happen <laughs> A university. 